On tap today, we have Jeff Thoskin. How are you doing today, good sir? Good. How are you doing, Aaron? I am doing fantastic. I am looking forward to this chat because after looking into your stuff, um, I got to confess, I do a lot of sci-fi stuff on here. And the first thing I do when I kind of jump off the sci-fi page, I love comedy. And since that is your forte, I'm looking to get into something a little different today. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I love sci-fi too. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, thank you. Let's, uh, let's, talk. let's do it. Yeah. So, I mean, I especially like the fact that um, we were talking very briefly about the fact that comedy is something that strikes people because you kind of have to be smart to get a joke. A joke plays with, and maybe you can fill me in on this, a joke plays with the way your brain thinks. And if you can kind of sidestep that, that's where the funny part comes in. Yeah, there, there's um, kind of something called like a rule of three. And it's usually like um, you'll, you'll, a lot of times you'll see a comedian when he's doing a joke he'll go yeah boom boom and then boom and then the third one is like the twist and the, mm -hmm. the the twist is what usually gets the laugh it's like obvious obvious not obvious and mm -hmm. so that's that's sort of why you see that pattern it's called the pattern of three and why people um so it's it's being able to kind of see something a little differently than other people see it and then presenting it and then that's what kind of triggers the the response hopefully a laugh <laughs> sure but i haven't seen that many laughs in the last few years if, if i look at my because i have a lot of stand-up comedy and i see that it, my collection kind of drops off around 2007 and i'm not quite sure why that is but i have a harder time finding stuff that really tickles that funny bone until you know again i like your stuff a lot thank you so i'm, I'm wondering if, if you can kind of give me your idea of what's going on in the comedy world Oh, yeah, I have to admit, I'm, you know, there's there's definitely like I, I still love Jim Gaffigan. I love uh, Bill Burr. There's there's a lot of really, you know, funny, um, funny folks out there. You know, it's it's funny as a comedian, I tend to I, as I started doing more and more stand up, I stopped watching comedy because you want you want as much only because mm -hmm. you want to be careful you're always paranoid that, that you hear something and then you forgot you heard it and then you think you think thought of it. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> and the, the best way to avoid that is to is to kind of not immerse yourself in it to pick up on premises you may not have picked up on and stuff like that. That's just me personally. Like um, I used to, do you know, uh, Mitch Hedberg, you know, mm -hmm. that, that comedian. So he's a real funny guy. He passed away a long time ago, but like I used to not be able to listen to him before a show because if I got on stage, I would talk like him and mm -hmm. not, not on purpose, like just subconsciously, because it would so, so be in my head. I would start to do it and I could hear myself doing it and can't and couldn't stop. And it wasn't like I was on purpose. I wasn't doing his jokes or anything. It was just that mm -hmm. I would pick up his cadence. <laughs> and so it was like I realized, all right, I can't I can't listen to him anywhere near a show. I can't get that in my head because I just I love the way he, his pattern of speech. So anyway. Uh, I mean, just to use one example of exactly what you're talking about there, I will confess to being a big Dennis Leary fan. Love his stuff. Have all his stuff in the mid-90s. And there have been suggestions that he lifted works from Bill Hicks. And I'm thinking it's not like Bill was using him. <laughs> the joke being that he's dead and you know dead. Yeah, yeah no no i get it i get it um, sure, no sure. but you know yeah i've heard i've heard that i, I know i never kind of dug into that um, and dennis leary and in, in, in himself is i think i think he went on to be a very accomplished actor writer and had some really great TV shows that he put out i don't i can't be i heard that same thing but i don't i don't know much about it you know just like i never I, I'm sure it happened where, you know, he picks up kind of like uh, a style of talk because I know he had a very abrasive delivery and how he approached things. And people may have thought that was very similar to Bill Hicks. I, I can't speak to whether sure. no, the I, actual I'm not material was, was paralleled or not. Um, but, you know, there's only so many premises in the world, too. So we're all going to talk about the same things. It's, you know, there was there was a time where. I would do, there was a sign, you know, killer injured construction worker, 
seventy five hundred dollars. That would that's a real sign, mm -hmm. you know, when you're driving up north. Or uh, and so I wrote a joke on it, mm -hmm. you know. And then sometimes I'd be at a show and someone else would have that joke too. But it's or not a joke on the sign. And as I I, I kind of learned at some point that if you make jokes about generic things, then you're going other people are gonna do the same things. And so you have to kind of just tap into your personal and and kind of hone the material that it's it's not liftable or if it is lifted it's so obvious that they took it because there's no way you had that exact same experience as me type thing so that's not a direct commentary on on dennis leary i'm just no, no, that's just I, my I, that's just my that's just that was just part of my evolution of when i would write write jokes and in comedy and stuff like that. Cause there's nothing worse than <laughs> being on a set and someone does uh, the almost, you know, the joke, a premise around that kind of joke. It's one thing if somebody talks about family and then you go and talk about family, that's okay. You know, I mean, as long as it's slightly, you know, it's probably gonna be different. But when the guy before, when the MC before you does a joke on that sign, there's only so many signs. <laughs> the, the audience isn't gonna laugh at yours. So it's like, Ugh, all right, scratch that joke. But the best way to avoid that you know, maybe just don't do those jokes. So that's what I, that's that was some advice that I had gotten early on is kind of just focus and make it more personal. So, yeah, that was, I, I picked him solely because it's probably the most visible example I can think of. And I, I'm trying not to pick on anybody in particular and he's famous enough now he can probably take the punch, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, how many comedians don't have a joke somewhere in their repertoire about being at the dentist? I mean, that's kind of like the go-to to start your material. Yeah, my, well, my dad was a dentist. So mm -hmm. I, I felt like uh, my actual first joke I ever wrote was about the dentist, but it was, um, it, but it was funny, but it was, I'm pretty confident nobody else had that exact joke. It wasn't about getting Novocaine or anything like that. Uh, it wasn't really even about being a dentist. I guess it just, there was a news article about a dentist and I kind of just mashed it together. But, um, but yeah, no, you're right. In the you know airplanes and stuff like that. I mean, if mm -hmm. you talk about the common common experiences that we all have, there is gonna you're gonna hit something that somebody else said, you know. And so it doesn't mean you stole it. it you know, we all have like-minded thinking. I mean, we you know, if you see something and you have a reaction, it's probably the normal reaction. You know, the job as a comedian is to not not use the initial reaction you know if if you if my buddy my buddy once said i uh not a comedian uh he, when he was watching comedians he's like look if i if they start a premise and i think of it just before they say it and it then they pick the wrong one to go with because if it's the obvious obvious one that even a non-comedian would would immediately react to or you know have that visual reaction or that thought then it's not it's not that creative. And so you, the, the idea for the comedians to kind of dig in even further and deeper into what somebody might not have thought of, but would immediately re resonate at the same time. So mm -hmm. like I say, you're, you're trying to you're trying to give the predictable reaction and then at the very last minute steer them in another direction. Yeah, well, I mean, if it's if it's the if it's the obvious thing that that people come up with, they didn't need a professional to tell it to them. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like uh, it's the job of the professional to, to kind of say, all right, that's the obvious reaction. What's the non-obvious reaction? Because that's what's going to be unique about the whole joke and the delivery and 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 making them remember you. If you know, if fifty people do the same dentist joke with the same punchline at some point those people aren't going to remember oh that was aaron or that was jeff you know then i it's just not going to happen you know like i remember yeah gary goldman's another great comic that's out now that i think is so funny so anyway i just thought of that so when it comes to lifting material and taking a step back from that are how many personas are out there because it seems like you know there is the the angry smoking screaming man is one that's kind of a classic. The guy in the baseball cap with the jersey is another. I, I mean, it seems like there are some tropes that stand ups do to to kind of go build their their persona. Have you seen that? Um, yeah, you know, I never. I I can I can see what you're saying. I never I never kind of looked at it. There is angry comedian. There is uh, observational comedian. Mm -hmm. There is you know deadpan there is one liner 
you know, there's there's definitely different approaches, but I think everybody has like their own way to get their point across and then that kind of makes it theirs. You know, like anybody who does just quick one liners, deadpan is gonna be compared to Stephen Wright, right? Because mm-hmm. he's a absolutely he, he did it. I don't know if he did first, but I mean, he's definitely the best. Yeah, I mean, he's like, he's amazing, right? So anybody who just goes, you know, I, <laughs> um, you know, it's, so it's, there's, you know, the, Mitch Hedberg has a, ver- has a very specific style, you know, long form, you could talk about Carlin, you know what I mean, or anything like that. And then, yeah, so I mean, there's definitely approaches. I, but yeah, I, I think that's why people gravitate to certain comedians or not. It just, it depends on, and which ones, you know, activate your brain the best? Like I, I had a friend of mine once say that he could not listen to Norm Macdonald, not because he didn't like the material, but just because the delivery of Norm Macdonald's style, which is always that I'm a little bit smarter than you or I'm a little bit dumber than you, whichever way you want to play it, it, it just rubbed him the wrong way. Oh, so that's how I feel about Dennis Miller. Though I love Dennis Miller like 80s when he was – it was kind of just a clever kind of um, I'm pretty smart kind of references. But then later, I, I just, you know, it got too political. Sometimes when these comedians get overtly political, it's just it's just not fun anymore. But um, I love Norm Macdonald, but he's another one where I could pick up his frame, his his voice patterns. So that's why, like, you know, his his voice patterns to me. And so I, I always thought he was hilarious, like when he was on Saturday Night Live doing the news and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff and his stand up comedy. I just think he's so funny. But again, you know, everybody, everybody's not going to like everybody. No. So it's all about just picking the ones that, you know, are, you know, that that make you laugh. It's just like everyone doesn't watch the same TV shows and everyone doesn't like the same movies and all that kind of stuff. It's all the same. It's all the same. And yeah, and comedy is so personal that it's things that uh it the explore the exploration is in trying to find what clicks with what person what works with what audience and it's you never can see that you just have to try it out it's one of those things that you just have to build your art in front of the audience yeah actually yeah exactly it's all that's why like you know everyone everyone who does comedy just craves stage time it's just all about getting on stage and doing the jokes over and over and over again. When people start, they're like, oh, I did, you know, I did my seven minutes. And then next week they're like, I'm doing seven new minutes. And I'm like, that's, I mean, you do new stuff, but it's all about, you know, getting that joke and doing it the thousandth time before you even get it where it's really good. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's about the repetition. It's, you know, when you hear a comedian's album that comes out, you know, their first album, they probably honed that material for 10 years. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So it's like if they didn't do it once and then go, oh, okay, that worked. Uh, now I'll write something new and do that. You know, it's it's not how it works. You keep doing the material over and over and over again and finding new directions to take it and ways to kind of expand it and make it better and better and better. You know, you keep finding things that just, you know, help it grow. It's So you got to you gotta keep feeding the material, keep doing it, getting new reactions and seeing where you can take it. And for somebody who doesn't really, ha- hasn't been exposed to that process, it would be like if you picked a major novelist like a Stephen King and and instead of saying you just picked up that book at the store and read it and it was amazing, if you had to sit with them as they type every word of it using only a piece of scratch paper for reference, that's what it's like to build it. It takes that much time and the audience sees every step of it. They don't just get the final product in the end. Right, right. As Stephen King probably writes every day for so many hours. Just it's just a matter of repetition, doing it, doing it, doing it, doing it, and it's the same thing with comedy. People just do do the jokes over and over and over again, and you know you 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 just find the 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 tone, you know, everything about it. So it becomes a part of you at some point, and so and then it can grow, you know, further than that. So. So when you're saying comedy becomes a part of you, how does it feel now at this point? Because you have you're established in your act and you have your own podcast. So obviously you're comfortable with performing. You're comfortable with with the the audience you've built up. How's that feeling now? It's it's funny. I was just I don't even I'm hoping it's been 
so long since I, I've done it. Thankfully, I, I record it, uh, my show so I can go back and listen. But I ended up focusing on, on uh, my podcast, the Jeff Dwoskin show, because you know, there, there wasn't that stage time and just needed that creative element. I'm starting to really enjoy the idea of podcasting because in addition to the conversations that I have with people, you know, I produce, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, some portion of it up front and then move into the conversation. And it's a different kind of mindset because you're doing something and you don't get that reaction. Uh, the joy of being on stage or the fear of being on stage is, uh, is, is, and then the fear is that they won't laugh mm -hmm. and then, you know, and then facing that fear, uh, each time you get on there and then enjoying that moment when you can connect with so many strangers and make them laugh and, and have a good time and share that, that, that moment together, no matter how fleeting it is, the podcast is a little different, right? You put it out and you're not there when they're listening. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a much different experience. I enjoy it because I can like, I can, the thing when you're doing it live is right. You know, a lot of times like if you have a bad show or something like that, and people tend to blame the audience, I think a lot of times it's your cadence is off. Like you're not, you're not doing it the way you thought you were doing it. Right. And, um, and so there is that subtlety where, if, you know, you, you can do your material and it not connect. Right. And because maybe your, your mind's somewhere else, something like that. With the podcast, it's interesting because you can kind of create it and and then put it together and listen to it and you can make edits. And so when you put it out, you're like, all right, well, this is the most perfect version of this that I could do at this moment. And then, you know, here, listen to it. And so it's 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 different. But yeah, and I kind of enjoy that part of it as well. So it's it's a different kind of take on it. And it's but it's, it's kind of cool. I, I, I enjoy it. How do you feel about your podcast? Same way. I so. very much do. And I, there is that fear there as much as somebody might be afraid of getting up on stage and wondering what the audience is going to think. I think there might be a, a hidden blessing in that, you know, what they're going to think within 10 seconds. There's no ambiguity. There's no doubt. It takes a while to get the the full brunt of a response to a podcast out there to see the listener numbers, to get the feedback, to read the emails, and that's in in some ways it feels like you're just on pins and needles the whole time. Because you know I put out episodes that I was I was crazy about, I was excited about the content, and I usually don't get bad feedback, but sometimes the lack of feedback was concerning. And then there were episodes that was like, I was not crazy about what happened. I, I thought that maybe I missed an opportunity to bring up a topic, and I, I regret that. And yet the response you get was, wow, this was a great chat. And and you get questions back that people that – I didn't even think of, of that angle. So, yeah, it's it's the delay that really makes it interesting in both good and bad ways. Yeah, no, I agree. It's um... – yeah, there's a couple of people I always wait for them to tweet at me. It's not official till I get their tweet. <laughs> they liked it, the episode. But uh, yeah, so that's cool. That's cool. But yeah. And I've been at this about a year and a half now. So I'm now starting to get the people who are just discovering the very early episodes and, you know, getting responses from that, knowing that I've built so much since then and developed the idea so much since then and, and, I, I, I don't want to tell them to skip ahead because it's like there's there's good stuff in between. Right, 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 right. But then you want you want them to see your growth too because mm -hmm. you probably get better and better and better each each week, which is uh, kind of cool. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's I always enjoy when I uh, I wake up and I see like oh how many old episodes got, how many old episodes got listened to, you know, weeks or months after they got post it it's it's kind of fun to see um to see that that people do dive back i always wonder where they find them you know because mm -hmm. i'm not put i'm pushing the old old ones you know some occasionally i'll i'll uh, promote an old one you know in a week i'll pick one but you know it's, it's always interesting to see what people find and i'm i really try not to make timely episodes i want something that'll have value whenever the person finds it i i really I, I don't envy people who are like, I'm going to do a movie review. I'm going to talk about the news because it's like you, you have your audience for a week and then 
episode really doesn't click with anybody. I, I want something that, you know, if you find this very conversation five years from now, I think it's going to be just as relevant in five years. Um, I I totally agree with you. Um, I I always I always try and make I I always try and either I'll edit out stuff that's mm-hmm. too specific to that moment, and um, and I agree because you want it to be somewhat evergreen where they can listen to it at any time, and so. Um, yeah, that's I, I try not to go deep into anything specific. And for, and if I do, I might get that episode out faster. So that's a trick to one of my guests. If you talk about something too topical, <laughs> <laughs> I may actually release it faster. So because um, otherwise, you know, you get this backlog. And so it, they don't necessarily. It's funny. I always say like the you could listen to my episodes and like the production value in the beginning and the end. You can you can judge my you know, progress you know, as a podcaster, but not my interview skills because I don't release them in the order that I did them. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it'd be like, you know, so like there's different. And then sometimes, you know, I always kind of fret about the the quality because not everyone can use every the thing that I like to record on. So sometimes I'll do it on Zoom and, you know, so, mm-hmm. it, you know, trying to get everything to kind of work in the right way is uh, kind of a balance. So. That, that was my biggest adjustment when I started this because I had a very certain image of what I wanted the show to look and sound like when I first started. And actually I was spoiled because my very first episode was almost exactly that. Um, I sat down with a good buddy of mine. We just had a microphone and we sat across the table, really high audio quality, really high video quality relative to the equipment I had. And after that, I started to realize I couldn't expect that every time. So I had to start getting creative as to how to put together all the pieces to create the final product. Even if the final product wasn't exactly what I would have wanted, it still works. And and even today, every episode looks and sounds a little different because the pieces are always just a little bit different. Right. You're kind of it's always based on whatever the other person has. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they don't always have microphones. They don't always have, you know, even any kind of headphones to, you know, to put to wear during it. And so, yeah, I, I, I get it. I get it. Then. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, if you go to podcasting help forums and stuff like that, there's so much dialogue as to what the best microphone is and but the best filters and the best con- processors and all that stuff is important. But you don't realize that sometimes you just use what you have. And, and there, there's no sense doing a good show because you don't have the right toys yeah i'm not you know you can have expensive toys and not put out a good Mm -hmm. show it's it's not like it's not like you spend a lot of money on something and it means it's going to be good Mm -hmm. you know so it's you know i have what i have i do the best i can but like uh you know i don't i i hear people with much more expensive stuff that i don't think sounds as good as your show or my show Mm -hmm. (laughs) so Let's um, let me pick your brain on that. I'm sure there's been at least one or two episodes where the audio quality just took a nosedive for whatever reason. Did that really show up in the audience? Did you get did, did people forget about the content in favor of just nitpicking the audio quality? Um, you know, I'll go like if if uh, if the voice ducks out and, you know, it won't, you know, does one, you know, one of those things. Um I'll just I'll just cut it out. I'm like, I, you know, I'll just I'll just rearrange sections or if I need to cut out three minutes of conversation because the volume, you know, a lot of times it's fine up to a second, you know, up to a point And then the the, the sound kind of something happens. Right. You know, maybe the Internet kind of goes wonky for a second. So, I mean, on my side, if I hear it like or if something happens or there's noise, I'll just repeat myself because I know I can edit it mm-hmm. later. But. A lot of times uh, the guest isn't necessarily aware of that or that they, they just went out. So, um, yeah, I'll just I try and cut it out or I'll I'll do something. It depends. It depends how egregious it is. And, and how, yeah. Sure. Fair enough. So <laughs> we started off just talking about your your forte and, and comedy. And uh, you, you were mentioned you were into sci fi. And that was something we also chatted a little bit about when we were setting this up. Uh, any particular uh, loves or hates in that front? Uh, 
you know, just right now, I'm just probably like most people, just kind of obsessed with the Mandalorian and and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I've had I have a good friend Dan Zare who hosts Coffee with Kenobi, and he has been kind enough to be on my show a couple times, and he's like a Star Wars expert. And the two of us, we met when we got flown out as influencers by Gillette to uh, Pinewood Studios in London for their big um, Rogue One. Uh, they did a big Rogue One uh, pro, uh, premiere thing. And so we went there. That's when I, I used to write for the Huffington Post. So I, I was brought out there as, as part of that to blog for for the event but that was so we we met and he was kind enough to come on and talk about the empire strikes back and then we talked in another episode we talked about the mandalorian and actually now it helps because my wife is really into the mandalorian so we already you know we wake up when they release a new episode and she's the one going let's watch it let's watch it (laughs) so that does help that does help and then uh but yeah that that's kind of what i'm into right now and just you know watching some old movies but nothing nothing much who's got the time who's got the time in between podcasts <laughs> absolutely and that's the thing. it does become a time crunch for sure uh, if you can set up a workflow it makes it a little bit better planning things out always helps yep yep for sure for sure yeah so you know i on my show i like it's kind of turned into like this pop culture comedy social trends kind of mashup and you know i, I didn't want to pin it into one corner you know, so I don't, I don't know if that's, you know, just, I wanted it to be fun and enjoyable to listen to, you mm-hmm. know, I named it after myself. So, um, <laughs> cause my other name didn't work out, but you know, but you know, so it's, it's all, it's all good. It's fun. I enjoy yeah. it. It's a lot of fun. I didn't, it's a, it's an obsession, new obsession. So I tend to get a little confused when somebody asked me what the show is about, because my response is usually was, I try to tell them what they want to hear or what would be useful to them. But it's about different things to different people. Everybody comes at it for a different reason. Like I have shows that are specifically about Star Trek, and I'm sure that that audience is mostly into Star Trek. But then I have people come on who are stand-up comedians or they are comic book artists or they're fellow podcasters, and they're going to bring in a different audience. They're going to bring in a different conversation. I think really we're just looking for what makes people want to do this, what gives them the motivation. Absolutely. Yeah. It's that's, I kind of feel the same way. There's, you know, I, I focus it on, you know, it's amazing conversations with, you know, really cool people and they all have really great stories to tell. So, you know, they come on and they talk about being on the set or, you know, giving some spill in the tea and giving some tidbits on things that you wouldn't necessarily know, or you wouldn't have, you know, read about in a normal interview where they were just promoting something. And so, you know, I think it's a it's a good way. I try and keep my conversations conversational, you know, mm-hmm. kind of like this and like not really it's not like Q&A. You know, I feel yeah. like the Q&A thing is like, ugh. you know, it's like uh, it's just hard because then they're just answering questions or not. Mm-hmm. You know, I always tell them, I'm like, go off on a tangent. I don't care. You know, get, yeah, no, <laughs> absolutely. Like, you know, tell, just share something. You know, it's it's totally, uh, um, you know, fine, you know, and so um you know those are the kind of things that i i find really interesting and that's sometimes when they start to kind of just drift off to the side that's where you, they start to remember things and might share something i always start off and like you know and ask them if there's anything they don't want to talk about or anything like that and usually they're they're pretty open you know and frankly if you know if something gets weird you can always just take it out i mean unless you're doing a live show but <laughs> i guess if you're doing a live show they would maybe the guests would be more precaution or cautious but uh so far everything's you know kind of been good and like you said you know you go through i've edited out entire parts of conversations just because you know the thread of it didn't match the rest of the thread and kind of went off in a whole different you know tangent and maybe if it was already a very long conversation you know, you know, that's a good maybe topic to have them back for another day or something like that. Yes. But, you know, that's 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 pretty much it. It's just I, th- I think all of them have really good conversations and the ones that don't usually, you know, don't get released right away. <laughs> well, that's not fair. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. I have so many 
released it. You know, someone's like, wait, you didn't release mine. No, no, I, it's, it, you know, it's, it's hard though. Cause then you want to figure out the right cadence, right? You don't want to do four Star Trek episodes in a row, right? right. Cause then it's like, you know, it's like, oh, well, if you're not into Star Trek, you're going to zone out. And so, but you could listen to one and like maybe here, it's kind of like watching the Queen's Gambit. I wasn't into chess and now I'm like, oh, chess. Okay, cool. You know, but I don't necessarily want chess every week. <laughs> you know, but yeah, I think, yeah, we have the same mindset, I think, when it comes to, you know, how we position everything and, and get the content out there. The Q&A thing is a big problem for me because, you know, since my audience, most of them, for whatever reason, are really into sci-fi conventions, they are really into the concept of Q&A. And so people come on the show and they're like, oh, you're going to do a Q&A. No, I'm not. I, I don't want to do a Q&A. You, you go to conventions for that. That's why you're there. You're not here for that. We're trying to take two steps back and instead of asking questions, get into why we're even talking about it, why it even matters. And that's something that I try to import part on people because, like I said, there's a time and place for the Q&A. It's not here. Right, right, right. I mean, you have questions ready. I mean, there's things that you want and directions you want to go. I think that was the thing when we started podcasting. You know, there's so much time to research Mm -hmm. <laughs> the people you're about to talk to and you know so it's you know making time for that it's not it's not all about just the 30 40 minutes or whatever that you're talking to the person you know there's there's a lot of times sometimes you spend an hour or so and it, longer if you watch movies you know to, that they were in to kind of get a feel for what you know what they were all about in that movie and like to be able to just kind of reference things or talk about things in a way that if you didn't watch the movie, you know, you mm -hmm. probably couldn't do at least at that moment. So, yeah, it's it's a, it's a lot. People don't I don't think understand how much goes into there's a lot of pre-work and a lot of post-work. The conversations kind of the easiest part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, there is a lot of that. And and typically somebody is not going to be on the other end of that screen unless they actually want to do the talking. So it's not too hard to get them to, to pick up the conversation. You just have, have to have something that, that sparks their interest. Like, for example, having Kevin Pike on, who was a filmmaker uh, from the 80s and, and 90s, I want to respect the fact that even though that's a big part of his life, it's a part of his life that was 20 years ago. Stuff's gone on since then. So if I'm going to bring up these things, I want to put it in that perspective. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's sort of how they feel about certain things and, mm -hmm. and and how they may or may not want to go into certain areas or feel like they haven't done anything in a while because they're all doing new stuff too exactly it's, it's kind of like probably when you go to a concert you just want to hear the greatest hits but <laughs> and everyone goes to the, the bathroom during the new songs but yeah but the new songs are good too you know the ones that you did love once were new songs mm -hmm. <laughs> right so it's uh there, there have been times when I've invited somebody on and uh, somebody of significance, and I won't need no names, but sure. somebody of significance, and I will say, hey, I would really like to have you on, but I have to confess my reason for asking is because you were a voice in a cartoon series that I liked when I was a kid, and I realized that was just like a one-day job for you, so just, just, just throw that out there as full disclosure. <laughs> Right, right, right. It's sometimes it's that one thing that just kind of connects you to them. And, and it again, it just comes down to how much they feel about that. Some people do. Some people have they did the one thing and they all talk to about it and they that's you know, they they embrace it. Mm -hmm. And then some people, you know, it's just, you know, you have to balance it out. It's all it's all just kind of that's why you just kind of let the, the conversation go. Like I was talking mm -hmm. to um, someone, he, he has done a lot of TV shows. And when I was replaying the interview, when I got to one of them, his tone kind of changed a bit on it. And I could tell it wasn't as a positive experience for mm -hmm. him. And I ended up just, I took that whole section out. You know what I mean? I just, I'm like, you know, this, it was a long conversation anyway. So I was like, you know, I'll just take this six minutes out. And there's no reason that you know, that needs to be part of it. I mean, he was gracious and answered everything and did all that, but you could just tell it wasn't the most fond memory that he mm -hmm. had. And so, you know, those, those are the kind of things you just kind of want to, um, didn't impact 
mm. the interview or anything like that. Nobody would even have noticed it was missing. <laughs> and the other thing is probably we listened to it so many times that they probably don't remember what they said or didn't say when it's all over. So I'm sure uh, you're not. Okay, sorry, didn't mean to no, I'm saying, I'm saying you're not going to hurt anyone's feelings by no. taking something out. <laughs> Okay, and I've not seen cases where somebody will just acknowledge without any malice or, or resentment that, you know, when I did this thing, it was a job. I got paid for it and I moved on. But then they'll, they'll realize, but I realized, you know, 10, 15 years later that that one day gig really meant a lot to somebody. People were affected by it. They were, you know, their lives were enhanced by something that I did for a one day gig. And that is not unimportant to them. I respect that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And most, I think most people love hearing about it, you know, knowing that one thing they did touched people and, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that's good. It's it's fun to hear that. And it's fun to tell people that, I think, you know. You know, we spend so much time trying to do big things to do good in the world. And sometimes we do it without even trying. And that should be recognized. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with you, sir. Yeah. Nobody, nobody doesn't. Like, I was talking to somebody... I was interviewing someone and they told a story and I said, oh, I talked to, you know, this person and they, oh, I love that person. You know, so I, I DM that person. And these are both famous people. I DM mm-hmm. the other one and go, hey, you know, this guy was had, had nothing but nice things to say about you. You know, I figured they still want to hear about that. You know, we're all people. So mm-hmm. it's fine. These people just happen to do things on movies and we're on cable a lot. <laughs> So. Well, Jeff, we just sat here and talked for almost 40 minutes about comedy and only told one joke, and it was mine, and it was a bad one. So <laughs> that might be a good place to wrap up here. Uh, where can people check out your show and your social media stuff? Sure. Um, my show is jeffisfunny.com. The name of the show is The Jeff Dewaskin Show, which you could also type in thejeffdewaskinshow.com, but I find people can spell jeffisfunny.com. A little mm-hmm. easier <laughs> uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Jeff Dewaskin show. My personal is at big Macher, and I'm at Facebook at uh, Jeff is funny, but I, and um, here's the thing, Aaron, about when you, but most people, comedians talk about comedy. It, it isn't a hilarious conversation only because it's, it's serious business and we just, it our is. job is to make you laugh. But the, the stuff behind it is, you know, we, you know, it's, there's a lot of thought and stuff that goes into it. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's part of it. I've, en- I've enjoyed this time. Thank you for having me. me. Me as well. And when I say we didn't tell a joke, I actually, I find that because it amuses me more than anything else. Not that it's any way disappointing because I would like to have you back at some point very soon. Oh, for sure. Anytime, sir. I would okay. love to be back, Aaron. Thank you. Well, let's call it quits for now and you take good care.